Let's open our Bibles. Let me ask you to join me at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 15, and let's start at verse 1. He writes to them, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Now, before I go any further, he's continuing what he was discussing in chapter 14. Some older Christian realizes that physical things have no bearing on your spiritual soul. Uh, that's why we put no stock in water baptism or church membership or any other gesture, whether it's the, like a lot of the churches, they put a big stock in to making the sign of the crisscross on the front of their body um, or kneeling in front of a statue or praying on a string of beads or a knotted rope. Uh, all of these things have absolutely no effect on your spiritual condition with God. They really don't. In fact, they may, they may um, work against you having a good relationship with God. If you're depending on those things to sort of get attention, look at me or God, I hope you're noticing what I'm doing. Those things have absolutely no effect on your spiritual life and your identity. But let's suppose there's a mature Christian and he realizes, like the example Paul was referring to in chapter 14, that some meat, some food that had been uh, involved in a pagan ceremony and then is resold in a public marketplace afterwards, it's perfectly all right to buy it if you get a good price on it. Um, take it home and cook it for your family and eat it. But not every Christian would have that kind of conviction. He's not convinced of it yet. He thinks there's something evil attached to the meat or the food. Let me let you in on a little secret. Just us girls, right? And whoever, however many thousands are watching via live stream. We have uh, a lot of Buddhist families at, uh, we serve at my day job in the funeral home. And they're very uh, diligent to make an altar in front of the casket to the memory, the legacy of that person. Uh, now to us, we would think that the, the body that person lived in was should be the centerpiece in a, a place of prominence for a funeral. Not so with a lot of Asian Buddhists. They'll take a, a table, put a table in front of the casket, and the, ca and the table has a, a portrait of the deceased. That takes centerpiece, center place rather. A couple of bowls of fruit, a couple of bowls of rice, maybe some bowls of soup, um, and these things, lit, uh, candles lit, incense burning, these things done uh, to, to uh, garner good merit uh, in the Buddhist afterlife. Um, you, you do good deeds, good, offer good gestures to earn good merit for yourself so that one day that good merit will come back to you through good karma and uh, you will reap some benefit for having done good in the past for someone else's sake. Who, who decides who gets the reward, how this thing uh, functions and operates, because Buddhism claims they don't believe in any central deity. So who's in charge of the process? Who decides someone's going to get a reward, or who decides someone's going to get a punishment for something bad they had done. 
they have no solid answer to that question. Some people seem to believe that reward and eternity in peace and bliss and or with God depend on their actions in, the, in this life now. Nothing could be further from the truth. But if someone eats meat that was used in a pagan ceremony and a younger Christian sees you doing that, they're, and they're not persuaded yet that it's okay, that that meat or that item can, can have no effect on you spiritually. So they need a little more time to be persuaded that nothing bad's going to happen to you. Oh, back to my story, my, my self-revealing story. So um, I will confess to all of you, if it's sin, it was sin, and God forgive me for this. But I've stolen an apple off the off the off Buddhist table. They they put some magnificent fruit out there. You seen the apples on uh, for sale at a Korean market? I mean, these things are ma massive. And uh, the same way at uh, Vietnamese and the Cambodian Buddhist altars, uh, you got it. You can't pass it up. I mean, <laughs> um, because what happens is. After the funeral, they just leave it behind anyway. They don't take it with them. Just the act of offering it for the memory of that person is all that they were interested in to uh, earn good karma so that one day it'll come back to them in the form of a benefit. So I figure, well, I'm kind of hungry. So uh, I, I took one once. Okay, now it's going to be the subject matter of all the comments uh, under the video today. A lot of you like to comment on irrelevant topics in the sermon. Um, I used to work for Focus on the Family. And uh, before the internet was available, people had to communicate their lunacy by actually writing a letter. And uh, my job, part of my job, was to read the mail that came into Focus on the Family. They'd get um, nearly 8,000 pieces of mail a day. And there were about 35, 40 of us. That was our job, to just read the mail. I think my assignment was 144 pieces of mail a day. I had to read and um, then code it and send it on to the next stage. What I didn't know was that my supervisor was going through and rereading the mail I had done, make sure I had done it right. So one day I thought I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, give it all I've got. I read over 300 pieces of mail that day, and I'm sure my supervisor hated me because it was it was her job to go ba go back through and reread it, make sure I hadn't made any mistakes. But you'd get people who um, didn't know how to communicate to us except by sending an envelope with a letter filled with gobbledygook. You have an idea, what, what, what are they talking about? And you know, inside there might be a piece of string, something they thought we needed. And uh, so now that's not so much the problem. Now it's people who have a keyboard and a a, a laptop and unlimited time and you have no idea what their point is. They'll go on in a story that had nothing to do with the sermon. But um, that's okay. But for the grace of God, there go I. So All right, let me try to keep going here. Let's, um, let's begin, uh, well, we just read um, verse 1. Continue with verse 2. Let everyone of us please his neighbor 
for his good to edification. For, every, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, that would be the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of peace, excuse me, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one accord, excuse me, with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. I'm going to stop right there. Today, a lot of churches are in the habit of coining little cute phrases they think will summarize their ministry, summarize their their work um, in their church. And uh, too many churches, I believe, have lost sight of their primary objectives. But the churches will come up with little phrases like, to know him and to make him known. I suppose it's fine as far as it goes, but they don't identify who him is who they're trying to uh, know and make him known. There's uh, one church in the area, and their, their slogan is to be relevant, relational, and real. You know something? There's nothing more unreal and phony sounding than that phrase. Why would you put that on your building? And um, there's a big, and they, they uh, change names. Um, no more Baptist church, no more Methodist church, no more Presbyterian church. Um, now they simply call themselves Purpose Church. Or the one up the street, Truth Church. They even drop the articles. There's no the truth or a purpose or the purpose. They drop that. It's, it, it's poor English. There's one I heard of called uh, Dominion Church, I think out near Redlands. And there's another one called the um, Solid Rock Church. It's not a solid rock or the solid rock or Christ the solid rock. I noticed something else. Um, last, or a couple weeks ago, I was watching an old video on YouTube. It was between supposed evangel evangelical or evangelistic churches. Uh, they had this joint meeting with the leaders of the Mormon church. The Mormons welcomed them in to their big tabernacle in Salt Lake City for some combination church gathering. I think this was a way of the Mormon church trying to sell themselves and show themselves that we're just true believers um, like anyone else. Maybe we differ on a few minor things. The things that we differ with Mormons on is not minor. But, so I watched this and... Um, I thought, you know what, these guys, some guy was the president of Biola University, someone else was the president of Fuller Theological Seminary, Ravi Zacharias, who was very popular, who was very popular as an apologist, uh, was the guest speaker. And uh, have you ever noticed there's a lot of psychological manipulating, manipulation taking place among the uh, the appearance of Mormons. You see one guy riding his bike down the street with his suit on, and the second guy doesn't have a coat on. You're going to say, well, that second guy forgot his coat. But if you see two young men 
dressed in short white sleeve shirts, well, writing it, you're going to say that's planned. They each dress that way. They all want to look like each other. In, I, I found a Mormon handbook, and I, I think I lost it now, but it, it, stip, it specified how young Mormon missionaries should dress. What color suits to wear, what color neckties to wear, what kind of haircuts to sport. Um, and even, and um, this was their guidebook, certain conservative colors, and et cetera. Well, I was watching this gathering, and um, all these guys that were on the non-Mormon side, most of them were probably saved, and I'm not going to doubt that. But they were wearing suits of every color in the world and um, mix and match button up shirts it, with the suit. And all the Mormon men were dressed like businessmen. They had the prescribed haircuts for, for each of them, conservative color suits, conservative color neckties, white dress shirts so that there's a sort of a uniform look of, of neatness among them. And they believe that their appearance reflects the, the superiority of their faith. They carry their Bibles around proudly. Don't, they don't know them. And they can't quote scripture. And this, is, this makes it much easier for us to witness to them, because we can quote scripture to them, cite chapter and verse, they don't know where you're at or what you're talking about. They bluff their way through. But, so when churches no long, if you, if you go to a Presbyterian church, or you go to a Methodist church, or a Baptist church, you have some idea, you should have some idea what kind of message you might hear, what kind of doctrine you might, that might be taught. They have an answer for that too at modern churches. We don't teach doctrines. We don't bother with that. All we try to do is share the love of Jesus with everybody. Share the love of Jesus. That's a scriptural impossibility. You cannot do that. The love of Jesus Christ was deposited on Mount Calvary when the Lord Jesus suffered for the sake of sinners and bore the judgment in his body for the sin that you would one day commit, even before you were born. Christ's body was so sinless and impeccable and virtuous so that he never, you never read about Christ having to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice for anything because he had no sins of his own. He had none. And so we never read about Christ having to offer a sacrifice to have one of the priests offer for him at the temple. And this was how flawless and pure the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. To have never sinned in thought word or deed. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around a being like the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but um, the Lord Jesus' love was deposited at Mount Calvary by the Heavenly Father. And that's where someone has to go if they want to know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to go to Calvary. And you can only do it by faith. You can only do it by faith, uh, looking back at the cross of Christ and what the Lord Jesus did for your sake, to be punished for your sin, to bear the chastisement and judgment in himself for everything you and I would one day commit. Now, I'm so grateful that I got saved as a young boy. Some of you did not. Some of you have, many of you have, the younger ones here. Um, and uh, others don't get saved until 
much older in life. And uh, I can't answer why people come to Christ at different ages, different times in their lives. But um, I'm just grateful, eternally grateful, that I did come to Christ as a six-year-old boy. But it's been said, the local church uh, exists for three primary reasons. Number one, to evangelize the sinner. Number two, to edify the saint. Number three, to exalt the Savior. If you pursue the first two, the third should naturally follow. Evangelize the sinner, edify the saint, and hopefully in so doing you exalt the Savior. All three of these elements are contained in the text we read. Hopefully we'll be able to get to it. Uh, quickly consider the difference between the definitions of church. There is the global or worldwide church, universal church, of all true believers. Anyone, any man, woman, boy, girl, tall, short, older, younger, it doesn't matter what language you grew up speaking, which society or culture you're from, it doesn't matter what your history and uh, life has been, if you have truly turned to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're trusting in Him and His shed blood alone to wash you clean from your sin, and trusting in nothing else except the grace of God through the death of Christ, you are part of the worldwide, the global, universal church of the Lord Jesus Christ, what we call the bride, collectively, of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ here in the world. A group of people in proximity to each other who want to meet together to uh, praise God together, read the scriptures together, uh, have encouragement from one another, and uh, do something together for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we think of as the local church. In the worldwide body of Christ, there is no such thing as an unsaved member. The body of Jesus Christ, collectively, by definition, is only made up of saved born-again men and women. And um, now, in a local assembly, a local group, you may, on occasion, have some unsaved person, some unsaved man or woman drop in. They, they seem friendly. They seem to like the music. They seem to like the people. And um, you thought, well, great, we're going to get a new convert here. Um, and they never do get saved, and before long, they're gone. So you, on occasion, you might find an unsaved person who says they're saved, and they think that they are, but uh, it's evident by other things in their lives and their conversation, they're not truly born again. So today, let me consider the work of the local church. I know I've talked a lot longer than I should have. But uh, first of all, the work of the local church includes evangelizing the sinner. If you're not saved, we want you to get saved. And um, you have no good excuse that God will consider, or God will accept, one day when you're standing before Him at the great white throne judgment, and you have no way to justify refusing Jesus Christ when you had the chance. Christ told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 3. Paul reminds the Corinthians that it was the gospel um, of how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And he says, by which 
you're saved. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 2. Look at uh, Romans 15, and notice verse um, 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as is written, the reproaches of them that reproached uh, thee fell on me. He took the chastisement of God in our place. He took the shame of our sin on himself, although he had none of his own. But he died and suffered for the sake of my soul, my six-year-old soul, that, you know, my dad was preaching that day how that without Jesus Christ, in order to make it to heaven, you need Jesus Christ. He has to forgive you of your sins. And for the very first time in my young life, I was paying attention, and um, I was sitting in about the front row, and he uh, offered an invitation at the close of our service, and uh, I walked from that front row right down here, big tears in my eyes, I couldn't help it. I knew I was lost, and I didn't want to go to hell when I died, so in the best way I could, I came down front here, uh, down on my face, just crying and crying, asking God to forgive me, forgive me. That's all I knew to say. But something was taking place in me, something real, that um, I'll never forget. And I pray to the Lord I never do forget it. But everything we do when we gather together should be with the goal, with the objective, of winning somebody to Jesus Christ. From the way we greet a stranger that walks in for the first time, um, the friendliness we try to convey and show, and make sure it's genuine, not phony. The greeting they get, greeting another person, um, greeting one another. The Lord Jesus said, John 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. And so it's not just the kindness you extend to somebody you just met, but when they see the way you treat one another, that has an influence, that has an effect. The way you sing for the Lord Jesus Christ, Sing with joy, sing with enthusiasm, sing with some excitement. When the disciples gathered with the Lord Jesus uh, the night he was betrayed, the Bible says they sang a hymn and went out. Um, I wonder if they just kind of sang, you know, quietly and sort of mumbled along the way some of you do. Um, or do you think they had a little bit of enthusiasm. They had some thing to sing about. I want to believe the latter, <laughs> not the former. But um, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. But um, offering a testimony, a public testimony from time to time, offer some praise and thanks to God, uh, recount some miracle that came to you or your family during the previous week. And don't hold back. Don't keep it to yourself, but let us know what happened and how God blessed you. It's a blessing to us to hear it. It really is. Learn to pass out a track. Learn to talk to somebody. Now, it may be it may take a little uh, effort. Um, it might be a challenge. But if you take a track and find some place, find some person you can pass that along to, or leave it somewhere where you know someone is going to pick it up and read it, do that. You do that once a week. You got 52 tracks 
in a year. I realize that's not a lot compared to what some people try to do. But it's, it's something. You're putting forth some effort. And so I'm not going to discount whatever effort that Christian might put forth. But the work of the local church involves evangelizing the sinner. Secondly, the, lo the work of the local church involves the edifying of the saint. Edifying of the saint. The worse this world gets, the worse these times get, the more you need to be with other believers. And the more they need to be with you. I heard some atheist on a public show saying, what it, why is it that Christians and religious believers have to meet every week, every single week, they have to get together, go through the same thing. Well, why do you eat breakfast every day? Why do you sleep every night? You, you need to do some things every day for your own strength. And as a believer, I need to be with other Christians, other believers, for my own strength. But uh, notice verse 2 in our text. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Look back at chapter 14, verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. To edify means to benefit or to improve someone, either intellectually or spiritually. That's what the word edify means, to be benefited, to be helped, improved, um, intellectually or spiritually. And in our text here, the, um, hmm. excuse me, let me find it. The local church and the local pastor, local preacher at that church tries to supply the saints, the body of that church, with edification, back in verse 2, with learning, verse 4, with comfort, verse 4, with hope, verse 4, with patience and consolation, verse 5. And where do those things come from? Scripture, verse 4. <laughs> That's why we are Bible-believing Christians. This is Bible Baptist Church. The word Bible is more important than the word Baptist, than the word uh, any other kind of identification. And we believe in historic Baptist distinctives. We do. But uh, there is no such thing as a Baptist church mentioned in the New Testament. That's simply the truth. But those things come from the Scriptures. And uh, Hebrews 10, verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, uh, as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Galatians 6, verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You want to bear the burdens uh, or the prayer requests, the heartaches uh, and disappointments of your fellow believers in a local church. The, the men and the ladies. I was noticing this room over here this morning. There are two little um, hooks on the wall, on that end and on that end. And those little uh, hooks have been there for at least 55 years, 60 years. And um, when I was young, we would have uh, a foot washing service. We did that. Mm -hmm. And we held it every year at the same time. On the same day, it was, it was the evening service 
following Mother's Day. And uh, we would gather about an hour early, sing a song or so, pray, and then pull the curtain in between. Ladies could be on one side, the men on the other, and um, we, we wanted to respect their privacy as, as well as our own. And uh, so the ladies could wash each other's feet on one side, and the men, uh, the men on the other. And um, now there's no, I don't believe we ever considered it an ordinance, but it was a practice that maybe Pastor Underhill many years ago had adopted, and the church members would come early on Sunday night. We would do that, pray together, sing together, and it was always a blessing. It, it really was. And like I say, um, there's no commandment or ordinance to wash one another's feet. Some churches treat it like that, but they don't have any scripture for it. And um, the local church exists to edify the saints. When some new convert turns to the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to see them taught that one of the most prevalent ways of identifying yourself as a believer in the New Testament was through water baptism. And that doesn't save you, but it's an identification that you are now washed clean by the blood of Christ and you're trying to illustrate it with the water. and uh, Or the Lord's Supper. Uh, these elements symbolize the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't save you uh, whatsoever, but they symbolize the body of Christ that was shed and broken for you. So, let me move on. But this local church exists to edify the saint. And lastly, a local church exists to exalt the Savior. Notice verses 6 and 7 in our text. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And I mentioned earlier, these verses follow his discussion in chapter 14. Don't let the, um, don't let the word glorify frighten anybody. Don't let the word glorify intimidate you. It sounds um, majestic. It sounds grand. But it simply means to honor Christ. If you honor him with everything you have and possess, God will receive glory. He will receive glory that way. If there's a place that wouldn't honor the Lord Jesus if you were to hang around there, don't go there. If there's some activity that's not going to honor the Son of God, don't be involved in it. If there's some, and I'm, I'm talking about everything, should be surrendered to him, and whether it passes the test of glorifying or, or uh, exalting the Savior. There's some magazine on your coffee table that you really wouldn't want uh, me or any other church member to see. Get rid of it. I, years and years ago, Pastor Underhill, who founded the church that's here, had a, had a man come to him and say, Pastor, we went to my daughter and son-in-law's house, and uh, I mistakenly opened their refrigerator and saw all kinds of uh, bottles of beer, and I didn't think they were ventured to... to drink alcohol of any kind. What should I do? What should I do? And uh, Pastor Underhill gave the guy some good advice. 
uh, I hope you closed the refrigerator and kept your mouth shut. Let God deal with that guy. You have to let God deal with something. You try to fix every problem, you'll make a bigger mess of it. You really will. You let you. It, it, it's it's a test to see how much of a prayer you are. How, how much how diligent are you to pray that God intervenes and changes the heart of that person? So some things require you to keep your mouth shut, back off, and trust God to fix it. But in so doing. You, believe it or not, you wouldn't think so, but in so doing, you are actually glorifying Jesus Christ, edifying, or rather, uh, exalting the Savior, because you are turning it over to his, into his hands, letting him fix the problem. So, I'm going to bring this to a close. I've talk, talked longer than I intended to, but the work of the local church is to evangelize the sinner to edify the saints. I get edified when I'm with you. I get edified when we talk to each other week after week, when we sing together, when we pray together, when we read the Bible together. I get edified by that. And I want to exalt the Savior by those things. If you do the first, the third follows automatically.